Today is Wednesday, May 12th. We are now live with the latest in the crypto world. It's 9.30 a.m. in New York City, 2.30 p.m. in London, 10.30 p.m. in Tokyo, and 3.30 p.m. here in Malta. We have Jason Fernandez and Edward Iskra on the show with us today to share their views on the markets and trending market moves. But first, let's take a quick look at what the market share is today. The cryptocurrency index CCI30 has climbed above the 4,200 point level. It stands 7% in the red so far in June and it is up by nearly 100% year to date. The 30-day Bitcoin volatility index stood at just over 4.6% mark yesterday after moving south of the 5% level on Monday. The CoinMarketCap website's 24-hour traded volume indicator has edged up to return back above the $60 billion mark. The Missouri website's real 10 volume measures at close to $2.3 billion. The Bitcoin dominance indicator has shown no significant moves over the recent days as it hovers at just over the 55% zone. The top five digital assets are mostly trading higher. Bitcoin has continued staying close to the 8K price range. Ether is approaching the $250 level. XRP trades at just under the key 40 cent resistance line. The surge continues for Litecoin as it printed a fresh 52 week high at $140. And lastly, Bitcoin Cash is virtually unchanged as it trades at just under $390. The Coin360 heat map shows a mixed performance as the large caps are mostly showing no significant moves. Litecoin and Binance Coin are two of the top performers. According to the token spread website, the Bitstamp and CEX exchanges have posted the biggest intermarket price difference for the Bitcoin dollar pair, and it is slightly less than half a percent. The XMO exchange has the biggest spread of just under one tenth of a percent. Now let's take a look at some of the characteristics of the Grin cryptocurrency. It is an open source software project that uses the Mimble Wimble blockchain. This protocol provides scalability, privacy and fungibility, thus addressing the issues that most of the current blockchain implementations do of course have. This cryptocurrency was launched earlier this year and its price spiked above the $260 mark initially. This was followed by a sharp decline as mining took care of a lack of liquidity. According to the CoinMarketCap website's price feed, the digital asset all-time high of just under $15 was posted in January of this year and as of today, it trades at slightly more than $3.30. Now let's take a look at the performance of various digital assets based on their use case and asset classes. The infrastructure group has gained 0.3%. There are plenty of increases. The media and entertainment category is virtually unchanged. The Funfair token is the most bearish asset with a drop of nearly 5%. The Poet token has increased by more than 6.5%. The financial sector is up by nearly 2%. The Binance coin is on a sharp move up, while the Chainlink token is down by almost 7%. The currency category shows an increase of approximately half a percent, and Litecoin and Grin are the two currencies diving, excuse me, driving the gains today. And lastly, the services section posts the top increase today as it stands 2.3% in the green. Wax and Storage are the top gainers with double digit surges. This is where the five major cryptocurrency categories stand so far this Wednesday. Now, before we head to a short break, we will leave you with a overview of the most significant gains and drops among the top 100 digital assets. Let's take a look.
180 different countries all around the world, which makes us grow in like a sphere. We are stronger than ever. Have these questions answered without disclosing anything. AI field is mostly controlled by a few large corporations. Much busier, bigger than ever. In the mid 2020s, I do think that will come. We should kind of keep in mind that we want the world to be a better place. $15 billion a day, this is incredible. People find a way to create infrastructure. I, I, I think knowledge is one of the most important things in the world. We laid the foundation for the distributed trust model that Satoshi builds on. It does come with some risks, but at the same time, I think it's an opportunity um, for countries. Individuals miss the boat on our market, they miss the boat. When the institutions miss the boat, they bring the boat back. This is Blocks Live TV. We are back with Jason Fernandez, COO and co-founder of AE Token, and Edward Iskra, Bitcoin Gold Board member. Guys, great to have you. How are you doing today? Great. Hello. Thanks. Good, good. Now, Jason, we'll come to you first. Bitcoin continues to stay close to the $8,000 level. Trading activity has actually slowed down from the recent highs. So when could we break out of this range? So I said last week that it would not surprise me to see uh, Bitcoin cross $8,000 really soon. Uh, and I see that it's just happened a couple hours ago. We crossed 8000 uh, and it's been over 8000 now for a couple hours at least. Um, so that that looks pretty good. Uh, trading activity slowing down is never it's never a good thing generally. Uh, but I would say now it's clearly in the last couple hours it's picked up since it crossed uh, 8000 uh, not only has it stayed uh, sort of comfortably away, not really comfortably, but like let's say 8,020, 8,040, uh, it's been going back and forth uh, pretty comfortably between there for the past couple hours. So uh, that looks good too. So I would say that that, that uh, to the extent that it's been, uh, it was trading below 8,000, we've certain, certainly breached that. And trading activity is also up. So okay. it's good. So rather positive there since um, it is actually doing better in the last few hours, as you say. And Edward, will come to you. Um, when do you think we could break out of this range? Uh, I think it could happen any time. Um, it, it's true that we backed off from the you know, close to 9,000 that we almost hit recently and that the trade volumes are down since that level. But they're not down to the levels we saw earlier this year. In fact, we're, we're well above the levels of January, February, March, April. Um, in fact, we're, 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 we're above most of May's trading levels, except for that hot period where the, the, the price really started to spike up. So it, it's actually a very stable base. Um, also, I, I note that at the $8,000 mark, if you compare it to one year ago today, we're, we're still above where Bitcoin was trading a full year ago. Most of the summer of last year, it traded in the low 6,000s. So we've really recovered from the bit of a crash that we had at the end of 2018 in November, December, um, and we're above that already. So it's it's not reasonable to expect it to continuously rise, but there's also absolutely no reason to expect it to fall. Um, I think right now we might be in a very news sensitive period. If we have some very good news come out about Bitcoin, I can see us easy coming up to 9,000. And if we have some negative news come out, something serious, I can easily see us dropping back towards 7,000. Okay, very, very interesting. So you do think that it's actually going to be affected um, by the news. Very interesting there. Now, Litecoin continues its bullish performance, gaining approximately 40% over the past seven days to print fresh 52-week high at $140. Litecoin's hash rate has been on a surge recently, as actually pointed out by Matty Greenspan on our show yesterday. Charlie Lee has actually tweeted out that mining will still be profitable after halving and um, with electricity costings less than, excuse me, with electricity actually costing less than 10 cents. So can we expect the hash rate to drop after halving takes place? And are there any price implications there, Jason? So after halving, we expect the hash rate will actually increase. Uh, right now, it continues to rise exponentially, and that will probably continue to do so, uh, continue to rise in the coming month, coming weeks. Um, the rise in Litecoin might actually uh, increase after the halving. At least that's what the implication is, and that's why everybody is sort of stocking up on it now. Uh, with a high hash rate, uh, that also increases the difficulty of mining. 
and that combined uh, with the having of the record, uh, sorry, sorry, the uh, having of the reward, um, it will re basically result in a sharp reduction in the gains that uh, a lot of Litecoin miners were seeing, uh, and so that should uh, that could basically uh, play out in two different ways. One is that a whole bunch of Litecoin uh, miners could just stop would just stop mining Litecoin because it's really not profitable to do so. Uh, what uh, what Charlie Lee has said uh, that it would it would still be economical even uh, under ten cents sort of remains to be seen. One of the reasons that that uh, um, mining has sort of taken off is the seven nanometer processors, uh, seven nanometer ASIC miners that were just recently released are a lot more efficient than the ones that were being used, you know, a couple years ago. So that that has also led to the you know increased mining. Uh, but basically, it could go two ways. One is that a lot of people could say you know it's just not economical for us, it's not worth our time to really to really mine anymore. Uh, or on the other hand, it could actually uh, to compensate for the fall in earnings, the price could actually rise to compensate for that. Uh, so of course, that's what a lot of people are expecting. We could really go both ways. I think just like anything really in this space, it's just one of those things where you're just going to have to wait and see which way it goes. Now, Edward, we'll come back to you. Um, your thoughts on this for us, please. Um, I, I think there probably will be a bit of a decline in the hash rate and the amount of people mining after the halving happens, because although it's true that mining will stay profitable if your power rates are under 10 cents, there are people for whom the power rate is not under 10 cents. It's, it's pretty variable. Um, so anyone who's paying around 10 cents, just as a reference point, if you're running the, the most common Litecoin miner right now, the, the Bitmain's uh, a, a, a miner, um, you're looking at about $3 of revenue per day right now of which about a dollar is profit given current power rates of 10 cents. Now, if the reward gets halved, then your revenue drops from three dollars to a buck fifty, and your profit drops from a dollar profit to a fifty cent loss. So at that threshold, you will see people turning off their miners unless they're, you know, avid supporters of Litecoin or believe that they want to mine now at a loss and hold that coin, hoping for a rise later in the price. Um, so I do think we will see some drop off immediately after the halving, but. Like Charlie Lee said, there are a lot of people out there who are paying less than 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So for them, it can remain profitable or break even for them to keep mining. And of course, as soon as some people start to drop out of mining, the difficulty will decline. And when the difficulty adjusts for that, it'll make it profitable for the people who have lower costs of power. There's, there's no worry about the, the system maintaining itself because it'll always adjust to the market prices. It's just a question of whether everyone will be able to continue to mine or whether it will become more restricted to the people who happen to have a lot of hardware and happen to have very cheap power. Okay, so definitely depending on quite a lot of things there. Now, Jason, very interesting. You are based in India, and India has actually reportedly proposed a jail term of up to 10 years for dealing with cryptocurrencies. Is this something that could actually be implemented, and what would it actually mean for the markets? Yeah, so India's approach towards crypto has been uh, hostile for a while. Uh, there have been those in, among uh, uh, inside the community that are optimists and sort of think that the Indian government will come out with laws that in line with the technology. Uh, but if this information is correct, this report is correct, uh, then the opposite is happening. Um, and it's true that this hasn't been confirmed by any government sources. Uh, but my guess is that this would probably be uh, just a trial balloon sort of floated to gauge the reaction of uh, people at large. Uh, a complete ban is technologically impossible, uh, especially so long as there are such things as decentralized exchanges, uh, etc. Uh, but right now, there exists uh, something like a quasi-ban uh, in the form of a notice that the RBI, the main banking institution, has sent to private and public banks uh, to basically disallow any sort of crypto transactions. Uh, so they informed uh, customers via their banks also uh, that they consider buying or selling cryptocurrencies to be, you know, via bank account to be illegal. Uh, so the concern is that, uh, that this sort of restriction will ultimately be codified uh, by the government and it will and of course that the government will go to uh, start begin to go after you know crypto holders. Uh, as far as the market the largest concerned, uh, Indian crypto regulations have had very limited uh, are basically a very limited percentage of the overall transactions worldwide and so it will have very little actual real world effect at least in the short term uh, once it's implemented. Uh, in fact, like I said, there's already been a quasi ban 
uh, as I mentioned previously. The real negative effect uh, is for India and for the Indian blockchain community and the Indian blockchain industry and programmers and developers in India uh, because it forces those professionals to move overseas uh, to earn their money. And it also sorts, sort of uh, paints this whole the whole industry with this uh, this uh, this sort of shady brush where uh, anybody in crypto or in blockchain uh, is considered you know maybe working on something illegal. It's just a really odd thing to sort of uh, criminalize technology. It's really strange to me. And you're right, it absolutely does criminalize it and it kind of doesn't help, does it, in terms of the connotations that are already associated with the space. And I think it's interesting um, that you say that a ban would be impossible. So very interesting. Now, Edward, we'll come back to you. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, I have so many thoughts here. Um, I, I want to note that when the news first came out about this proposed ban, which was proposed by Indian legislators, um, the, the, the Reserve Bank of India actually came out with a statement denying they had anything to do with this legislation and did not, did not coordinate with them. So there's, there's already some dissent within the regulatory agencies in India. Um, I, I also find it interesting to note that although Jason's absolutely right, uh, this ban won't have a global impact on pricing because India is a relatively low portion of the crypto markets worldwide, in part because of these bans. If India did eventually uh, loosen up these restrictions and allow people to do what they wanted to, we would see, I think, a pretty significant upside for the global crypto markets because we're talking about a, a relatively large, I mean, a really large, pop, second biggest population in the world. Um, and these are people who are very technologically oriented who might have a lot of interest here. And, and that may, in fact, speak to, in part, why these sorts of harsh bans are being proposed. Um, the RBI has, has noted that, you know, they plan to do a, a digital rupee in the future, so perhaps they want to protect their digital rupee against the in, encroachment by other digital currencies. But it's also worth noting that in terms of cultural history and tradition, um, I, I think it's still true that India, uh, people from India, as a rule, uh, uh, collect and, and hold more gold than any other kind of, uh, any other cultural population in the world. So they have a lot of amassed wealth in terms of, of, of stored gold. Um, and that goes across the population. You know, wealthy Indians and and, and relatively uh, less affluent Indians all like to collect gold. So it could also be that the legislators are worried about the impact of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies on the price of gold. And certainly that's not helped by recent campaigns we've seen between, you know, people who promote gold and people who are promoting Bitcoin as an alternative to gold. They have to be worried about the value of all those holdings, both on the government side and on the individual side. Absolutely, because there is that push at the moment between is it about gold or is it about Bitcoin or perhaps it's about both. And very interesting um, points you make with regards to, you know, if there wasn't that ban, then perhaps um, there would be a bigger impact on the market globally um, in a positive way. Now, just moving on, Visa has launched a new cross-border payment network that uses some aspects of the distributed ledger technology. So, Ed, it will come to you. Is this significant for the industry and can applications like this rival with what Ripple is? currently building. Oh, absolutely, they can rival what, what Ripple's building, because um, fundamentally, uh, what Ripple's technology is, is a method to use blockchain uh, within a closed system among a small set of peers. Um, that's exactly what banks have already been doing, just that they haven't been doing it with blockchain. Uh, banks have been doing it by reconciling their books with others' books. They've been trying to make centralized clearinghouses, but all of those approaches are relatively inefficient. When you use distributed ledger technology, then you're looking at everybody having the same ledgers at all times and communicating the information in a way that only requires the trust of those partners who are in on it. And you can do it in a way where you don't have to trust those partners, you just have to integrate them into your system. So this technology is exactly what the banking industry needs to speed up their reconciliations and cross-border payments. And, and yes, it's, it's absolutely a threat to Ripple's model. Okay, so it can rival Ripple. And Jason, what do you think? Do you tend to agree with Edward here? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, Visa has uh, massive resources and has been in the payments industry for a really long time. So you certainly have the cloud 
to make something make something like this happen and make it you know efficient and and uh, and worth their while. They're certainly also moving enough money around to where uh, figuring out the most efficient uh, way to do it is sort of one of the uh, their main reasons for existing ultimately. Uh, but it, it it all comes down to how much to fees uh, and visas. Fees have generally been really high in comparison to Ripple right now. Uh, but uh, it, again, you know, when you're moving cash around, it, it's an inherently uh, inefficient and thus far has not really been proven to be uh, the best way of going about it. And it generally just costs more. So there is that. But uh, that's something that they could definitely get around using a model similar to what, you know, JP Morgan is doing, for example. Okay. Yeah. If I could add to that. Of course you may. Please do. Um, it, it's worth noting that although, yes, Visa's fees are much higher than Ripple's, uh, Visa also has much higher costs and it's providing a lot more services than Ripple because it's not just about the payment transfer. Visa also has loss reserves that are used uh, to account for fraud. Visa also requ uh, offers insurance and other services on some of their uh, systems. So there's a lot that Visa is doing beyond what a simple payment system will do. But they're very aware within their system of the cost of the transactions themselves. And it's obvious that they're seeing Seeing that there is a less expensive and more efficient way to handle the actual transactions, but there's no reason to think that they want to pay an outside party for their system if they can affordably do it themselves. And apparently they think they can affordably do it themselves and they're doing it. Absolutely. I guess it just comes down to the fact that Visa do have massive resources, like Jason mentioned. Now, according to CNBC's website, the Coinbase card will be available in Spain, Germany, France, Italy, Ireland, and the Netherlands as of today. Very interesting, very exciting. So is this likely to encourage users to actually spend their digital assets? And what influence could this actually have on the markets, Edward? Uh, this could be argued to go either way. Um, obviously, it's going to be a plus for people who have crypto to learn that there's a, a set of cars that are available across all these countries that they can use to spend their assets. But the question isn't what happens to those people, because the people who currently own crypto haven't been acquiring it in order to spend it. They're, they're vested in the system they think is a long-term prospect, and, and they've dealt with the fact that you know they have to gradually sell off a little bit if they want to spend it and then transfer into traditional systems to make it easy to use. The question is how this will impact people who are not yet in the market. And I think that will be net positive and lead them to come in. What I mean is if someone's thinking, well, maybe I'll buy some crypto, maybe not. Well, wait a minute. If I buy it, even if I profit, how, how can I use it? I can't like spend it like a debit card or a credit card. Uh, maybe I'll not get into it. It's just going to be a hassle. I don't want to learn to use a, some weird crypto wallet software hardware thing. Well, for those people, the idea that they can invest in crypto, even if it's on a whim, but have availability to use those those, those revenues or reclaim that revenue just by using a, a, a credit card, that can be a very appealing thing. That can lower the, the emotional or, or, or psychological barrier to coming into the crypto space. If they're less worried about the availability of their funds, then they're going to be more willing to get involved. And I think that, in general, will tend to a positive impact. Some people will spend a little more because it's going to be easier to spend the crypto they already have, but I think whole Holders are mostly going to want to hold on, and the bigger impact is going to be new people coming in who find this to be freeing. Okay, interesting. So it could be very, very positive for adoption there. Now, Jason, we'll come back to you. What are your thoughts? So, yeah, we hear a lot about on ramps, uh, but off ramps are also really important. Uh, so basically, this Coinbase card links to a, like a mobile app uh, where you can, as a customer, you can select uh, basically which cryptocurrency you want to fund each of your purchases. Um, and it's, but essentially, it's important to note that the customers aren't basically paying, uh, that aren't directly paying the merchants in crypto. Uh, they're basically paying uh, in cash, and Coinbase is charging them a fee to convert uh, their crypto holdings into uh, fiat holdings. And so, in the short term, what this means is that there's going to be a lot of crypto uh, going out and being converted to fiat. Uh, and But the assumption is, uh, in the long term, that uh, people may choose to keep most of their funds in crypto wallets instead of, like, savings accounts, for example, uh, and with the thought that that money will at least earn them some return uh, over time as that money, uh, as, as, as those tokens go up. Uh, but as, 
but the main thing that's important to a lot of them is that uh, that it's a it's a fairly liquid manner of making transactions, uh, and and that's good for crypto in general because as Edward said, a lot of people may choose to say, oh well, you know, uh, if I can just spend money directly off this credit card, I might as well just put all my money uh, instead of using a savings account onto this crypto wallet, and I'll just manage it using this app. And ultimately, a lot of the major fintech uh, uh, innovations happening, Apple Pay, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, come down to essentially uh, allowing you to manage your money efficiently via an app. And so uh, that's that's an area that you know is growing. And using crypto, having crypto uh, to add to that whole equation, uh, can be will obviously be good for crypto in general. If it, at least it leads to more more people buying it. Absolutely, because it just sounds so simple. It seems very very easy for the customer. Now, just finally, Coin Telegraph reports that according to um, the vice president of one of the biggest banks in Brazil, major banks will introduce a unique blockchain platform today. We spoke about Ripple opening an office in Brazil earlier this week. So, could this be connected? We'll go back to you, Jason. Here. So my gut feeling is that these two pieces of information are connected. Uh, one interesting fact is that both the Ripple news and the Bradesco news uh, was announced at the same major conference. So it was like a Latin American uh, banking and fintech event known as CIA, CIAB Febra Bannon, uh, June 11th. Uh, of course, I pronounce that terribly, but uh, essentially the, the VP of Bredesco said that uh, a lot of local banks had been uh, had been developing applications using distributed ledger technology. Um, and, and sort of uh, the fact that this was announced at the same time as Ripple's uh, announcement, which was also done again at the same event, uh, sort of implies to me that these things are linked because Ripple's whole, uh, one of their major things is to essentially make partnerships with banks uh, pretty much around the world. And uh, if they were to open a branch within Brazil and then magically uh, start a lot of the Brazilian banks are working on blockchain and DLT applications. It certainly seems like there's some tie in with Ripple, uh, at least on a gut level. That's what I would that's what I would uh, expect. And just finally, Edward, the final word from you, please. I'll sort of throw in the contrary position. Although these things are very timed together and there are several indicators they could be connected, um, there's also no reason to be certain that they are. It makes perfect sense for Ripple to open an office in Brazil, considering it's a, it's a major economy. It's one of the BRIC countries. Um, it makes sense that if uh, Brazilian banks have been working on distributed ledger technology, that Ripple should want to get in there and make sure they can compete. So it's possible that they're connected, but it's also possible that Ripple is just trying to make sure they don't lose too much uh, potential market share in, in an area of the world that matters. Um, that, that said, I, I think it's pretty likely that it is related because the timing is just too coincidental. But I, I, just wouldn't, I just wouldn't make it a certainty. The question I would ask is, if it were Ripple's technology being used here, why would they not have said so? Um, I, I don't see any compelling reasons that they should deny or pretend that it's not Ripple. So I, I don't see a good explanation for why they're not doing it. I mean, they, could have been banned from doing so by for regulatory reasons. Um, it could even be that they're going to be involved, but they're not allowed to say they're involved. They could have some sort of arrangement with uh, Brazil, which says, you know, you're not going to advertise this, but we'll use your technology under this kind of licensing agreement. There's a lot of possibilities, um, but we really can't be sure until we have some actual firm news. Edward, Jason, as always, it's been an absolute pleasure having both of you on the line with us today. Thank you very, very much. It's been my pleasure. Thanks, Leo. Absolutely. Now, before we sign off, I do have a last minute update from my editorial staff regarding the crypto market. The total market capitalization has increased towards the $260 billion zone. This comes as Bitcoin has stepped slightly above the key $8,000 level. There are no major changes in terms of trading activity. The coin market cap website's daily trading volume still stands slightly above the $60 billion mark. Litecoin is still the top performer among the large caps as it trades near the $140 territory. Well, that is all for this Wednesday's Crypto Now live show. We thank Edward and Jason for their expert analysis. We thank the audience for joining us and invite you all to accompany us every weekday at the same time.